on life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another amazing episode of Women Impacting the World. This is Kekisha, founder president of Green Hope Foundation, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. My co-moderators today are Joshua, head of our Green Hope chapter in Oman, and Hitasha, outreach officer of Green Hope Oman. Today, we have amongst us a woman who is a force to be reckoned with and who has dedicated her life to ensuring equitable progress in the field of education. And I am delighted that our audience on Zoom and Facebook Live will be able to hear about her inspiring journey. Now, the UN Charter drawn up in 1945 equates women's rights with human rights. And 75 long years have passed since its adoption. And while some progress has been made, the weight of thousands of years of history still bears down heavily on us because the weight of social pressures, of expectations that a woman must juggle responsibilities at home, family, while seeking out a career for herself continue to impede our progress. While women on one hand are leading missions to space, there are still many societies where we are bound by tradition to walk behind men, failure to do so bringing retribution, violence, defamation, and slander. And conveniently, the data gaps that continue to exist with regard to gender help to shroud this inequality. And goal five of the Sustainable Development Goals proclaims that the end of all forms of discrimination of violence against women and girls everywhere by 2030. But to do that, we need to first end the discrimination that exists in our mindsets, starting in our homes, how we raise our children and our societies, questioning culture and tradition that prevent girls and women from going to school or wearing what we want. And our vulnerability is exacerbated during natural disasters, during wars, during pandemics, such as the one where we currently suffer from the impacts mm -hmm. in a far more disproportionate manner. Climate change affects us more. And it's ironic that even the age we live in, the Anthropocene literally means the age of man. And despite these barriers and gross violations, there have been women who have forged ahead, stamping their presence through sheer hard work and talent, showcasing time and again that we are second to none. And it is these inspirational journeys that we are bringing to you through our series on women impacting the world. And no one exemplifies this better than our guest today, Dr. Vicki Phillips, Chief Education Officer of the iconic National Geographic Society. Dr. Phillips, we are so honored to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm so honored by the invitation. So we are so excited to be able to speak to you today and learn more about your journey. And you have been such a powerful force in the field of education. So how did you start your journey in the field of education and what motivated you to do so? You know, I grew up on a small farm in rural America. We grew vegetables, we raised nearly everything we ate. And I grew up with a sense of what it's like to live in a rural place where you feed for yourself and look out for your neighbor. But I was connected to the natural world around me and I had this driving curiosity about learning and this love of learning. So whenever I had a free moment, I would read. After dinner, I'd go down the field, across the creek, I'd read a book in the nook of a tree until dark and my mother started yelling my name loudly. Um, and through the pages of those books, I learned about all these faraway places and experiences from the wildebeest migration of the Serengeti to the Great Wall of China. So learning took me everywhere, and I wanted to help do that for other young people. So that was one thing. And the second was that down the road from where I lived was um, a family of 11 kids, many of which struggled with developmental disabilities. 
and as a result were mistreated throughout high school in particular. And I rode the bus with them every day and saw this. It wasn't until my senior year that a special class was offered that they attended and I watched them blossom. And it was such a powerful example for me of how education can affect the trajectory of someone's life and their sense of uh, well-being. Absolutely, yeah. And as an avid reader myself, I can completely relate to uh, learning so much from books and my mom and uh, dad shouting at me to like come away from the book and focus uh, and start doing uh, something else. But I completely get that, you know, with the reading, you learn so much. And th thank you for talking to us about how important it is that you mentioned a really important uh, point on education and how often a lot of people are discriminated against because of uh, because they have different learning abilities. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us today. I think uh, Joshua, uh, wait, no, Hitasha has uh, raised her. Do you guys have any uh, follow-up questions uh, to that? Um, I would like to ask Dr. Phillips, what challenges did she face along the way? And were there any challenges that you faced as a woman in the field specifically? Well, you know, as a farm girl, I wasn't pushed very hard in school because people considered me too poor and no one expected me to succeed. And as I got older, I wasn't encouraged to pursue higher education. Nobody in my family went to college. And in the community I grew up in, achieving a college degree away from home was viewed almost as a betrayal of my roots and family. So when I decided to go to college, my family disowned me. It was incredibly challenging, but I wanted to fight for my education and I wasn't willing to accept that what was expected of me growing up would determine where I would end up. And so I made it to college, not in the normal way, and my time even there wasn't easy. I didn't have the habits of learning and scholarship that I needed, and in many ways had to learn how to, relearn how to learn, even though I had read um, widely. And then as a woman, I've definitely experienced some pushback in my career, but I must say that I've been fortunate that it's been far outweighed by people who were supportive of me, including men. Um, you know, one example early on in my career, I was about 26 or 27 years old and Tom Boysen, who was an incredible leader at the Kentucky Department of Education in America, offered me this huge growth opportunity one bigger than I could have or was aspiring to. And I'll never forget what he said to me when he gave me that job. He said, Phillips, I've watched you. I've seen your work. I don't care what age you are. I don't care what gender you are. You can do this job. You won't always get it right. You will make mistakes. It's not whether you make those mistakes. It's how quickly you overcome them and to not repeat that pattern. It was a really important lesson for me because it gave me the freedom not to be perfect. And it helped instill in me the power to persist through failure. It also reinforced that it was not my age or my gender that mattered. It was how well I could do the job. Absolutely. And yeah, I agree. No, we firmly believe that age and gender have nothing to do with capability. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, ask a follow-up uh, question to that. You mentioned that you, know, you had a support system. So in general, even in your career now as, uh, as a person who's done so much work, how important do you think support systems are and why do you think it's so important, especially as a woman in the field? I think support systems are incredibly important and surrounding yourself with a network of people who um, you know, can, can help make a difference in your life and, and who can help give you some guidance is incredibly powerful. And I think sometimes people don't understand how important that network is for young people or even what a difference one person can make. Lots of people have an example of a story about a teacher, for example, who made a humongous difference in their life. For mine, it was a young person. Uh, the first person to ever encourage me to think about going to college was a friend from an affluent family who thought I should have the same chances that she did. 
She saw my potential. She encouraged me to think about it. She even drove me to take the college exams. And so my life was changed by someone who saw my love of learning and was really unwilling to accept the inequities between us. And the same thing has happened for me throughout my career. Doors have been opened for me because people saw a willingness to learn, a passion for the work, a desire to make a difference, and some level of competency. And I think not all young people get that kind of lucky break, but one way you can help ensure you get it is to surround yourself with other people who can help open those doors, who can give you encouragement, who can help you persist and not be deterred from, from pursuing your dreams. Absolutely, thank you so much for uh, talking about that. And yes, support systems are so, so important. And I think uh, I see Hitasha's hand. Uh, Hitasha, you have the floor. Uh, can you elaborate more on what kind of support you uh, gave to young people? I think it's like, it's so important as well. Just thanks so much, Hitasha, for that question with like, you receive so much support as a young person. And I think it's, and you've given so much support to us as young people as well. So, yeah. Well, I think one thing that's been powerful over my lifetime is that I've had the opportunity to take jobs that allowed me to be in positions of influence around larger and larger numbers of young people. And I feel so strongly about that because I got such a lucky break. And, you know, um, how cool is it, for example, at National Geographic, which is taking such a unique approach to um, education, to really be able to support young people through things like grants, if we think about our young explorers, or provide opportunities for them to connect with real world experts and explorers around the world where they can see themselves in careers they might not imagine, doing things they might never have, have thought about, and you know, opening their doors to the wonder of the world and the ways that we all need to think about protecting it. Um, you know, to put uh, resources and tools and supports in educators' hands. You know, one of the things we believe strongly in is that young people uh, and the educators who reach them are the key to um, solving the pressing problems of our planet. We can't do that unless we really support young people to be critical thinkers and solution seekers. So surrounding them with great networks, making sure that they and their educators have the content and, and tools and knowledge they need, helping them develop and explore mindset. This may be language we use at National Geographic, but it's things I've worked toward my whole career, trying to make sure that young people, particularly those who have often been mar marginalized, get an equal chance at um, not just a great quality education, but also really incredible opportunities. And where their path is by design, not by the lucky break that mine turned out to be. So how did you connect your expertise in education to sustainable development? You know, it started, I, I guess my, um, my commitment to sustainable development um, started early on and has just built over the course of my career. Uh, you know, I mentioned that I grew up in a very rural community um, growing up poor, we had to be sustainable in pretty much everything we did. And what was the norm for us is now, thankfully, the expectation around many of these issues in the planet. And so I learned the value of taking care of the land in particular and taking care of your community because community was everything. Um, and um, as I uh, made my way across different cities during the course of my career, because I've taken up uh, opportunities as the doors opened. Uh, one of the experiences I had was to be the superintendent in Portland Public Schools in the Pacific Northwest in America. And there I really got my commitment um, solidified and stretched because that is a community both in Portland and later in Seattle that has such a deep appreciation for the natural world, including land, water, all of its inhabitants and all the full array of, of people. So I was fortunate there to work with organizations and get to know organizations like the Puget Sound Keepers, whose mission it was to preserve critical marine ecosystems in that area. But that could be in other places around the world. And I think that um, 
those experiences and now being at National Geographic, where our mission is to illuminate and protect the wonders of the world and um, where we have this powerful opportunity to elevate sustainable development in critical ways, working with young people and educators and explorers and others around the world, that has only, uh, you know, anchored that commitment further. So collectively, all those experiences have added up to both a personal and a professional commitment for me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Phillips. And I'd also just like to add that thank you so much for having the faith in uh, young people and giving us uh, that same respect. And thank you for sharing your uh, journey with us, specifically that you know you held such a powerful position in the field of education and you were able to bring about uh, so much change. So yeah, and you're, such, uh, you're a true inspiration to us. And since we work on education for sustainable development, you're like, it's the work that you've done is truly, truly amazing. Thank you. Dr. Phillips, I would like to ask, how did you feel when you became the Chief Education Officer at National Geographic Society? Uh, very excited. I mean, how cool is it to work for National Geographic? Um, there's something very special about how National Geographic Society um, how we're trying to approach education. It's so unique uh, because as I said earlier, we do believe that educators, um, you know, who reach young people and the young people themselves are the key to solving our planet's most pressing problems. I think, um, you know, one of our other young explorers says, young people are the world's most untapped resource for hope. And I think that is so true. You know, we like to say that young people are kind of generation geo, gen geo as we affectionately call them, which is a generation of young people who think critically, collaborate globally, and who are inspired to seek solutions. And I can't think of anything more important to be doing right now than empowering young people to succeed and letting them lead the way in making the world um, a much better, better place. Absolutely. And uh, with education, only through education do we get to know about our rights. Do we have the awareness about the challenges that our uh, planet is facing and then uh, have the awareness on how we can solve our planet's most uh, pressing issues. And I think young, starting that education and education from sustainable, for sustainable development from a young age is key to ensuring that we have that open mindset and we have uh, a multidisciplinary perspective when you look at the world's challenges. And Nat Geo is truly doing amazing uh, work in that field. Dr. Philip, I want to say your journey is so inspiring for us young people. How does it feel when you look back and reflect on your journey? You know, I feel very grateful and very fortunate. I mean, who knew that a kid from Falls of Rough, Kentucky, would end up on the path I've been on. I've had the great fortune to work with some extraordinary people around the world, um, but I was lucky. It might not have happened if it wasn't for that friend, that peer who changed my life. And I think I want people to know that one person can make an incredible difference in the life of, of another one. Absolutely, that is so, so true. And I think even for us as well at Green Hope, we completely agree with that and it resonates so, so deeply with us. Dr. Phillips, I would like to ask you that as a person in a leadership position, do you feel that people view you differently because you are a woman? Or do you feel that society has evolved to see you as a leader regardless of your gender? So, you know, people have definitely underestimated me along the way. Um, in my first superintendency, for example, there were men who were definitely critical. You know, they asked questions like, who are you to hold this job? You're a woman, you're younger than I am. Um, but I was self-aware enough to realize that that was happening. And I think resilient enough, largely maybe because of how I grew up and my path to college, I was resilient enough not to let it deter me. And because I had some of that support system that you guys, um, you know, we talked about earlier being so important. 
And I do believe that society has evolved, but I think there's so much more to do. I mean, you know, your opening statement, Kikshan, was so on the, you know, on point about that. And, you know, I think about this month in particular and the fact that we should learn from those women who came before us. You know, in the U.S., 100 years ago, women persisted on a very important issue, one they were deeply passionate about, which was the right to vote. They became advocates for themselves and others. They wouldn't take no for an answer. They supported each other along the way and change occurred as a result. And I think that on all these issues that we are passionate about, we have to learn those lessons and put those in, ingredients in and you know, act with um, resiliency and, and, um, and determination. Yes, absolutely. I think one of the greatest strengths of uh, women everywhere is that resilience and the determination to move forward and succeed. And I think that has actually contributed so much to our uh, success, despite all the obstacles that we face and continue to face from womb to grave. And another really important point that you mentioned is that, you know, we need role models and people to look up to. And I think that also contributes a lot to our success, seeing and learning from successful women everywhere. And uh, as I also mentioned before, Dr. Phillips, you exemplify that uh, the role model of the success that you've achieved. So we're- Thank you. I think it's so great that you guys are doing this series. Uh, and I appreciate being among the women you, you asked to, to come on. Yeah, absolutely. And even with women impacting the world, we are learning so much uh, about the women we are, are talking to. And they're all the women that we've looked up to all our lives and want to asp like aspire to be when uh, we, as, as we move forward in our careers and in our lives. So yeah, very happy that uh, so many amazing uh, women out there who continue to do work to change our planet forward the better. Dr. Phillips, can you please share an experience that changed your perspective of the world or influenced you very drastically? Well, as I said earlier, I grew up in a predominantly poor, white, rural community. There were fewer than five students of color in my high school. So attending college was a whole new world experience for me. New experiences, new cultures, new people. And in particular, there were two women of color with whom I became very close, the TA in my dorm and my roommate, who really drastically changed my worldview. Um, for example, my roommate Anna knew that my family had disowned me when I went to college, so she would always bring me home with her uh, to her family, to their gatherings for holidays and other things. And it was the first experience I'd had with different food and being connected to a very different family than my own. So those experiences profoundly expanded my worldview in addition to the reading that I did because uh, I have remained a voracious um, reader and I, um, you know, just wanted to learn more and more and more and understand more and more and more. So those two women in particular and of course my friend Cindy who, you know, with her actions opened up the world to me and, and changed my, my life. And you know, a lot of my career path, I would say, was in the early years, mostly focused on the U.S., but then when I went to work for Bill Melinda Gates at the Gates Foundation, that also gave me such a larger um, worldview, both the, the challenges and the possibilities and um, the array of um, culture and inhabitants on this planet that we need to take care of and protect. And then being at National Geographic again just continues to open my eyes to the issues and the possibilities. Absolutely. And uh, I think that the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary well, perspective of the world is so important when we want to achieve a just, equitable, and uh, peaceful world. So yeah, and the different challenges and different solutions of every single region and every single country are what uh, makes it more challenging to address the issues, but also allows uh, actually easier in a way because then you realize that you need to localize solutions. And once you have that awareness, which is where education comes in again, then you're able to move forward and view those issues as surmountable.
and can allow for more powerful innovations over time, right? The fact that we can now connect all of you wonderful young people out there who, who are that generation geo, who seek solutions and understand how to collaborate globally and hold such value for the perspectives that each other bring. I think that is um, a model that's going to serve the world very well going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And yes, young, we, as young people have been able to use uh, that mold, that tool of technology to uh, make sure that we use it to change the world for the better. Yeah. Dr. Phillips, I would like to ask you, you had an amazing journey, but looking back, what is the one accomplishment in your journey that you are most proud of? You know, that is a really hard question for me. Um, my entire career has been about taking roles where I believe I can use my skill, where I can continue to learn, and where I can have impact, most of all. And my trajectory has taken me to roles that, you know, as I mentioned, have allowed me to influence larger and larger numbers of young people. National Geographic's no exception. Our goal is to empower 100 million young people around the world to have empathy for the earth and to lift up 5 million of those as young leaders. So I think I'm most proud, proud over the course of my career of accomplishments that led me toward uh, reaching audacious goals. So setting those kinds of audacious goals and, you know, working uh, your way, way through them and particularly focused on addressing inequities. And, you know, one of the early experiences for me that was so powerful was that my first superintendency where I was in charge of a collection of schools um, was in a pl place that where there were very high levels of poverty and diversity. And when I first started there, 80% of the students in that um, area were below basic on any assessment of academic performance, as well as had lots of other um, inequities thrust upon them. And so they were at risk, the whole district was at risk, but we were able to work with community and change that trajectory for those students and get that place back on track. And it was such a um, powerful testament again to education and its power and community and its power. And those two things in combination, I think, are have led me to be able to have an impact on um, larger and larger goals and have led me to the things that I'm most proud of. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, now, Dr. Phillips, we, as we were speaking earlier, we are now hit with uh, the pandemic and there is now this concept of emerging into the new normal and building back better. So as someone who is, has worked in the field of education for so long, how do you think that we can build back better in the field of education everywhere, and especially for children from marginalized communities? Well, I think the people on the front lines right now are the young people, the children, and the educators who are trying and others who are trying to, you know, to, to reach them and who are figuring out what the new normal for education is during this pandemic. You know, whether it's a remote learning or a combination of in-person and remote and whether it's families as teachers or, or teachers more formally or, or, um, or explorers and others who are acting as educators in this moment. So I think um, thinking about a broader array of who is helping on education, thinking about all the ways we can put tools and supports in people's hands to, and directly in young people's hands, and probably most importantly, letting, hearing from educators and young people right now about the lessons they're learning at this moment in time, because they are on the front lines, and making sure that when we go back to something that looks more like normal used to look, that we don't discard the things that are actually working and that are actually big improvements on the system. So how do we keep that? How do we craft a new normal? But how do we do that through the voices of the educators and the young people that are actually experiencing it, experiencing it most acutely right now and their families? And I think we aren't doing 
enough listening yet in that regard. At National Geographic, we're determined to do that and we're getting better at it. But um, as a field in education, I think we are somewhat still quick to jump on, oh, we should try it this way or that way versus really listening to the experiences people are having in this actually dual pandemic, right? The pandemic of uh, COVID, but also the social injustice that we see around the world. And I think we should be listening and learning and helping craft a new normal so that we truly are in a better place going forward and in a stronger place to build from. Absolutely, and we definitely need a new social contract uh, for that one where we do not ignore uh, like what, like you said, what we did achieve during this pandemic and what we learned. And I think, and at Greenhope, we also firmly believe that listening to people, learning about their unique experiences and then implementing solutions is so critical. And education especially, is, that is so important when we're trying to educate someone and trying to empower uh, someone. That it is so important right now. And you know, one of the things that we are about to launch in a few weeks, it will become more public, um, we're, uh, we launched a few uh, months ago a COVID emergency fund for journalists as part of our storytelling work, but we are also going to launch a COVID remote learning emergency fund for educators so that educators can take those lessons they're learning and turn them into resources that actually work during this time of remote and you know hybrid kinds of learning models and can share those with other educators around the world. So we're very excited to be able to contribute small grants to help educators um, do that. So stay tuned for that and you guys can help us push out um, the fact that, that when that uh, fund goes live. Absolutely, that and that is gonna be so helpful for people in this field. And yeah, uh, we will definitely be a part of uh, helping out in that and spreading the word. Phillips, what gives you positive energy every day to go out and make a difference in people's lives? Let's see. There's so much that gives me positive energy. You know, I'm inherently an optimist. <laughs> and I think whenever, you know, I, um, I start to slide anywhere below having my glass half full, I you know, I just look at some of the impact that, um, that people are having out there. And, you know, from, you know, innovations we're seeing in science to innovations in technology to some of what I see teachers doing right now in this moment in time to, to very much change how education is, is practiced and how we reach, um, uh, more young people to what I see young people themselves doing. I mean, the the power of um, some of those solutions I'm seeing, all of that just gives me great uh, hope. And the stories about those things that come across my desk every single day or that I see on social um, media, I think I, I just believe that collectively we can help the world um, make a really important shift. And I firmly believe that young people are the key to that. So probably the thing that gives me the most hope are, are young people like you guys. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. You mentioned earlier that you were a superintendent in the field of education for Portland. So uh, how, what some are some of the initiatives that you think that nations and policymakers need to keep in mind to enhance the inclusivity of children? So in other words, how can we, how can policymakers improve education policy in terms of uh, children, especially in vulnerable communities? Well, I, I, you know, one of the things I've um, been able to do is be a superintendent a couple of different times and also be a state chief, which, so think of that as like a minister, you know, an education minister. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we can be doing right now is to really think hard uh, about this new normal, what it should look like, learn our lessons during this time, and then enact policies that allow that to grow and flourish. So, you know, you guys may be aware of a group called the Brookings Institute. And a few years ago, they put out a report called um, Leapfrogging. And it was about 
um, how do you uh, leapfrog kind of the current stale notions of education and think about education very differently and put a number of new innovations in play? And, um, you know, when I think about what some of those innovations might be, it's certainly um, increasing students' access to, to technology-based interventions that they can do anytime, anywhere, on any device, which also means we need to make sure that everybody has accessibility to internet and devices, particularly mobile devices. But it also means to me things like um, the kind of learning tools that keep students incredibly engaged, like project-based learning, making that a norm in schools where kids are working on driving questions that ignite their passions, where they are learning content, but they are also working on projects that make a difference and that they can take action on. So there's an array of things like that that I think we should be thinking about as you know, education leaders in the field from how we put more game-changing tools in the hands and content in the hands of young people and teachers, but also how we think about technology, making those technology enabled, how we push forward leaning technologies and make them more affordable and ubiquitous, um, and how we, like I said, listen consistently and make shifts. I think sometimes we decide we make a decision in education and we let it, a policy decision even, and we let it linger for years past its prime, right? When we should be thinking about changing that policy and putting a new one in place. And I think it's because we don't listen enough to educators and the young people that are being impacted. And we need some new mechanisms for making sure that leaders are doing that. Absolutely. That makes sense to you guys? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we have also seen that there are so many instances where you just mentioned that uh, the, there is a policy in place, but there's been nothing done to change that and adapt it to uh, the changing times. And I think that has been a big obstacle in terms of education for not just children, but also for girls as well. So thank you so much for bringing up that very crucial point. And I do think there are some specific things we should do for to elevate girls, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dr. Phillips, I was reading some stats the other day, and I noticed that in India alone, there are 56 children out of school. This is a problem everywhere. What do you think we can do to address? 56 million, just to add. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> 56 million. I think this means that we have to figure out to reach how to reach children where they are. And, um, you know, this is one of the conversations that we're having uh, with our explorers and others about how to do that, how to put tools in children's hands, uh, both, you know, print if that's the only thing available, also digital, but how we do that no matter where they are and how we consider uh, a much broader array of who's an educator, right? In a, in a less formal sense. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a big fan of teachers as educators and formal teachers, and I don't want any of that to go away. But I also think we have to recognize that there are other ways to help um, make sure that young people are learning and that we should have all of these things available. Um, in addition to, we should do formal things as you know, policymakers and leaders to, to ensure that, that children can be in school, um, whatever form school takes in a given country. Absolutely. I also wanted to uh, ask you, you spoke a lot about being an eternal optimist, and I completely identify with that. But, you know, we have naysayers in our lives, like everyone has that. So how, what keeps you positive in the face of adversity? I think part of what keeps me positive is that, you know, I have personal experience with that. You know, I, I described my growing up where I had to push past that and where uh, there were people along the way who also helped me do that. So I think I have, um, you know, I have a level of resilience in the face of adversity 
And, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, the guy who gave me the job uh, early on. And one of the things he said to me was um, in my performance evaluations, it's, he would say, one of the things I love about working with you is that no bureaucracy can stump you. You will figure out how to go around it, through it, over it, whatever it takes to get to a viable solution that will have impact on young people. And I think that that is just kind of always been my stance, that I am a solution seeker and that I believe there are solutions for most of the issues, that I believe that collective minds are much better than a single one, and that when we put our heads together and we work collaboratively, as you guys said earlier, globally, um, we can have an impact on most of these issues. And, that we, and it's why I believe so strongly in lifting young people's voices and giving them leadership, uh, because I think many of the things that need to happen and the ways of getting to that, you guys are sort of natural, you know, at doing. And um, so all of that keeps me optimistic, keeps me hopeful, gives me energy. I won't say that there haven't been times when, you know, a problem seemed nearly insurmountable, but I would typically then work on a different one and at some point come back and figure out, you know, with other people um, how, to, how to resolve things. So I think it's that kind of grit and determination and passion for what you care about uh, that keeps you resilient, strong and optimistic and, and hopeful. Absolutely. And I think passion is so important, passion and love for the work that you do where you don't just look at it as work, but you look at it as something that you love doing. And that is what drives you to move uh, forward. So whatever comes from the heart stays. And I think you uh, really embody that uh, so well. So And yeah. curiosity, right? Like curiosity about things and why they are why they are. And you know, one of the things that at National Geographic we believe strongly in, as you might imagine, is the power of geography. And not geography as many people think about it, where you're memorizing, you know, rivers or countries or, or which one, which river flows into what ocean, but where you think about geography as a way of seeing, as a way of understanding patterns, as understanding how the world was in order to understand why it is and how to make it different. And so we're very interested in giving um, young people, but everyone else in the world, a more modern view of geography as a discipline that really lends itself to solving these 21st century problems. And that enables young people to, you know, think critically, to see patterns, to see the interconnectedness of the world and how both powerful and extraordinary that interconnectedness is and how that should make us all want to protect the planet and everything that is you know on it um so we are you know those kinds of things keep us energized and excited and i think give us tools with which to tackle things in a way where we don't have to just be um daunted by what on some days can seem like a nearly insurmountable obstacle. Absolutely. And, you know, that interconnectedness it is what allows us to find our common humanity. And you also mentioned partnerships earlier. It, it really helps us to bridge those barriers, whether it's geographical or uh, social, and allow us to make a positive change in the world and have an intersectional approach while uh, doing that. You know, none of us can do this work alone. Absolutely. Um, so powerful partnerships, powerful networks, um, those are, are two really important ingredients in, in I think, um, the work that we need to do ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. How can you describe a day in your life? Hmm. Right now, a day in my life has a lot of Zoom calls. <laughs> But normally, a day in my life is, um, and even on, even as we work from home and use um, Zoom and other tools, you know, a day in my life is um, actually right now very heavily focused on our uh, strategy at National Geographic, our education strategy. So on any given day, I can be talking about 
the content tools that we are creating or the youth network or our latest cohort of young explorers or uh, an educator who um, just you know demonstrated for us how to use the power of geography to teach social justice. I mean, I can be talking to an explorer or uh, watching an explorer classroom that they're doing with young people. There's, there's a whole array of fantastic things but I think what's important about that is it's all aimed at this, these big audacious goals of putting game-changing tools in the hands of educators and youth, uh, empowering 100 million youth around the world uh, to have empathy for this planet we're on and maybe other planets at some point, and, um, and empowering 5 million of those as leaders, and then figuring out how to use geography and other 21st century disciplines to help um, sort of uh, push the field forward as well as put innovative tools in uh, people's hands. Uh, you know, a great example is we're working with an explorer right now on a, a virtual globe that you can actually ask questions of and it will change its appearance based on the question you ask and it will answer you. Um, so we get to work on everything from cool tools to with explorers to just everyday content that is so important for um, to put in in educators and young people's hands. So most days it's just really fun work. And I won't say that we don't run up against obstacles. We do, but uh, we have a team of people that, like you guys, are passionate and committed and dedicated to to figuring um, to figuring it out. And then on a personal level, you know, it's, um, I love to, you know, I love to be outside. So walking, you know, in my neighborhood, um, being outside now and, um, you know, a restaurant, but only outside given the current um, COVID. I love good food, wine. I love, I like to travel. Can't do that right now, but I'm sure it will come again. I, um, like a lot of people are connecting with my friends and others in virtual um, uh, times. And, um, you know, I continue to love to read. So I read pretty voraciously um, as well. Uh, Dr. Phillips, you have shared with us such an inspiring journey today, and we have learned so much from you. Uh, the last thing that I would like to ask you is what would be your message to everyone, especially to girls who dare to dream? I guess I would say don't stop dreaming or doing. Don't let anybody deter you. Reach out when you need help and support. Build that network of both uh, other young people and adult mentors and role models. Um, surround yourself with others who share your dream and um, you know, do everything you can to keep that sort of hopeful, optimistic view. And when you find yourself, um, you know, feeling like the world is a tough place, um, watch what some others are doing and take, um, you know, take heart and hope from the fact that there are innovations and solutions and other people who are passionate and who share your dreams and who are willing to come on the journey with you if you ask absolutely and you know i like i just mentioned we have had the past hour to learn so much uh today and thank you dr phillips for such an enlightening and inspiring discussion and you know you rightly highlighted the role of education in the process of the emancipation of children women and girls and for all of uh us who were part of the discussion today it's been an absolutely enriching experience and the learnings from this, I'm sure will help thousands of us to help uh, help that uh, self-belief within us to come out and understand that it's okay for us to dream and that dream can and will come true if we empower ourselves with education and the right tools. We must not be cowed and persist in facing up to the challenges so that sooner rather than later, we can cre create an even playing field for everyone and for all of humanity. So thank you once again for being with us today. 
Uh, to all of our viewers, we look forward to seeing you at our next episode of Women Impacting the World on 16th August. Please stay safe and let us all continue to dare to dream. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.